The Problems of Philosophy, Chapter 2, The Existence of Matter. In this chapter, we have to ask ourselves whether, in any sense at all, is there such thing as matter? Is there a table which has a certain intrinsic nature and continues to exist when I am not looking? Or is the table merely a product of my imagination, a dream table in a very prolonged dream? This question is of the greatest importance, for if we cannot be sure of the independent existence of objects, we cannot be sure of the independent existence of other people's bodies, and therefore still less of other people's minds, since we have no grounds for believing in their minds except such as are derived from observing their bodies. Thus, if we cannot be sure of the independent existence of objects, we shall be left alone in a desert. It may be that the whole outer world is nothing but a dream, and that we alone exist. This is an uncomfortable possibility, but although it cannot be strictly proved to be false, there is not the slightest reason to suppose that it is true. In this chapter, we shall have to see why this is the case. For if we, I mean, before we embark upon doubtful matters, let us try to find some more or less fixed point from which to start. Although we are doubting the physical existence of the table, we are not doubting the existence of the sense data which made us think that there was a table. We are not doubting that while we look, a certain color and shape appear to us, and while we press, a certain sensation of hardness is experienced by us. All this, which is psychological, we are not calling in question. In fact, whatever else may be doubtful, some, at least, of our immediate experiences seem absolutely certain. Descartes, who lived from 1596 to 1650, the founder of modern philosophy, invented a method which may still be used for profit, the method of systematic doubt. He determined that he would believe nothing which did not see quite clearly and distinctly to be true. Whatever he could bring himself to doubt, he would doubt until he saw reason for not doubting it. By applying this method, he gradually became convinced that the only existence of which he could be quite certain was his own. He imagined a deceitful demon who presented unreal things to his senses in a perpetual phantasmagoria. It might be very impossible that such a demon existed, but still it was possible, and therefore doubt concerning things perceived by the senses was possible. But doubt concerning his own existence was not possible, for if he did not exist, no demon could deceive him. If he doubted, he must exist. If he had any experiences whatever, he must exist. There's, thus, his own existence was absolutely certain to him. I think, therefore I am, he said, cogito ergo sum. And on the basis of this certainty, he set to work to build up again the world of knowledge which his doubt had laid in ruins. By inventing the method of doubt, and by showing that subjective things are the most certain, Descartes performed a great service to philosophy, and one which makes him still useful to us all as students of the subject. But some care is needed in using Descartes' argument. I think therefore I am, says rather more than is strictly certain. It might seem as though we were quite sure of being the same person day to day as we were yesterday. And this is no doubt true in some sense, but the real self is as hard to arrive at as the real table and does not seem to have that absolute convincing certainty that belongs to particular experiences. When I look at my table and see a certain brown color, what is quite certain at once is not I am seeing a brown color, but rather a brown color is being seen. This, of course, involves something or somebody which or who sees the brown color, but it does not of itself involve that more or less permanent person whom we call I. So far as immediate certainty goes, it might be that the something which sees the brown color is quite momentary and not the same as the something which has some different experience the next moment. Thus, it is our particular thoughts and feelings that have primitive certainty, and this applies to dreams and hallucinations, as well as normal perceptions. When we dream or see a ghost, we certainly do have the sensations we think we have, but for various reasons, it is held that no physical object corresponds to these sensations. Thus, the certainty of our knowledge and our own experiences does not have to be limited in any way to allow for exceptional cases. 
Here, therefore, we have for what it is worth a solid basis from which to begin our pursuit of knowledge. The problem we have to consider is this. Granted that we are certain of our sense data, have we any reason for regarding them as signs of the existence of something else which we can call the physical object? When we have enumerated all the sense data which we should naturally regard as connected with the table, have we said, so, said all there is to say about the table? Or is there still something else, something not a sense data, something which persists when we go out of the room? Common sense unhesitatingly answers that there is. What can be bought and sold and pushed around and have a cloth laid on it and so on cannot be a mere collection of sense data. If the cloth completely hides the table, we shall derive no sense data from the table. Therefore, if the cloth were merely sense data, it would have ceased to exist, and the cloth would be suspended in empty air, resting by miracle in the place where the table formerly was. This seems plainly absurd, but whoever wishes to become a philosopher must learn not to be frightened by absurdities. One great reason why it is felt that we must secure a physical object in addition to the sense data is that we want the same object for different people. When 10 people are sitting around a dinner table, it seems preposterous to maintain that they are not seeing the same tablecloth, but the same knives and forks and spoons and glasses. But the sense data are private to each separate person. What is immediately presented present to the sight of one is not immediately present to the sight of another. They all see things from slightly different points of view, and therefore, see them slightly differently. Thus, if there are to be public neutral objects, which can in some sense be known to many different people, there must be something over and above the private and particular sense data which appear to various people. What reason then have we for believing that there are such public neutral objects? The first answer that naturally occurs is that although different people may see the table slightly differently, still they all are seeing more or less similar things when they look at the table, and the variation in what they see follow the laws of perspective and reflection of light, so that it is easy to arrive at a permanent object underlying all the different people's sense data. I bought my table from the former occupant of my room. I could not buy his sense data, which died when he went away, but I could and did buy the confident expectation of more or less similar sense data. Thus, it is the fact that different people have similar sense data and that one person in a given place at different times has similar sense data, which makes us suppose that over and above the sense data, there is a permanent public object which underlies or causes the sense data of various people at various times. Now, insofar as the above considerations depend upon supposing that there are other people beside ourselves, they beg the very question at issue. Other people are represented to me by certain sense data, such as the sight of them or the sound of their voices. And if I had no reason to believe that there were physical objects independent of my sense data, I should have no reason to believe that other people exist except as part of my dream. Thus, when we are trying to show that there must be objects independent of our own sense data, we cannot appeal to testimony of other people, since this testimony itself consists of sense data and does not reveal other people's experiences, unless our own sense data are signs of things existing independently of us. We must therefore, if possible, find in our own purely private experiences the characteristics which show or tend to show that there are in the world things other than ourselves and of our private experiences. In one sense, it must be admitted that we can never prove the existence of things other than ourselves and our experiences. No logical absurdity results from the hypothesis that the world consists of myself and my thoughts and feelings and sensations, and that everything else is mere fancy. In dreams, a very complicated world may seem to be present, Yet on waking, we find it was a delusion. That is to say, 
we find that the sense data in the dream do not appear to have corresponded with such physical objects as we should naturally infer from our sense data. It is true that when the physical world is assumed, it is possible to find physical causes for the sense data in dreams. A door banging, for instance, may cause a stream of a naval engagement. But although in this case there is a physical cause for the sense data, it is not a physical object corresponding to the sense data in the way the actual naval battle will correspond. There is no logical impossibility in the supposition that the whole of life is a dream, in which we ourselves create all the objects that come before us. But although this is not logically impossible, there is no reason whatever to suppose that it is true, and it is, in fact, a less simple hypothesis, viewed as a means of accounting for the facts of our own life than the common sense hypothesis that there really are objects independent of us whose action on us causes our sensations. The way in which simplicity comes in from supposing that there really are physical objects is easily seen. If the cat appears at one moment in one part of the room and another moment in another part, it is natural to suppose that it has moved from one to the other, passing over a series of intermediate passing over a series of intermediate positions. But if it's merely a set of sense data, it cannot have ever been in any place where I did not see it. Thus, we shall have to suppose that it did not exist at all while I was not looking, but suddenly sprang into being in a whole new place. If our experience, if the cat exists, whether I see it or not, if we can understand from our own experience how it gets hungry between one meal and the next, but if it does not exist when I'm not seeing it, it seems odd that appetite should grow during non-existence, as fast as during existence. And if my cat consists only of sense data, it cannot be hungry, since no hunger but my own can be a sense datum to me. Thus, the behavior of the sense data, which represents the cat to me, though it seems quite natural when regarded as an expression of hunger, becomes utterly inexplicable when regarded as mere movements and changes of patches of color, which are as inescapable of hunger as a triangle is of playing football. But the difficulty in the case of the cat is nothing compared to the difficulty in the case of human beings. When human beings speak, that is, when we hear certain noises which we associate with ideas and simultaneously see certain motions of lips and expressions of face, it is very difficult to suppose that what we hear is not the expression of a thought, as we know it would be if we emitted the same sounds. Of course, similar things happen in dreams, where we are mistaken as to the existence of other people. But dreams are more or less suggested by what we call waking life, and are capable of being more or less accounted for on scientific principles, if we assume that there really is a physical world. Thus, every principle of simplicity urges us to adopt the natural view, that there really are objects other than ourselves and our sense data, which we have existence not dependent upon perceiving them. Of course, it is not by argument that we originally come to our belief in an independent external, external world. We find this belief ready in ourselves as soon as we begin to reflect. It is what may be called an instinctive belief. We should never have been led to question this belief, but for the fact that, at any rate, in case of sight, it seems as if the sense datum itself were instinctively believed to be independent object, whereas argument shows that the object cannot be identical with the sense data. This discovery, however, which is not at all paradoxical in the case of taste and smell and sound, and only slightly so in the case of touch, leaves undiminished our instinctive belief that there are objects corresponding to our sense data. Since this belief does not lead to any difficulties, but on the contrary tends to simplify and systematize our accounting for our experiences, there seems no good reason for rejecting it. We may therefore admit, with, though with a slight doubt derived from dreams, that the external world really does exist, and it is not wholly dependent for its existence upon our continuing to perceive it. The argument which has led us to this conclusion is doubtless less strong than we could wish, 
but it is typical of many philosophical arguments, and it is therefore worthwhile to consider briefly its general character and validity. All knowledge, we find, must be built upon our instinctive beliefs, and if these are rejected, nothing is left. But among our instinctive beliefs, there are some much stronger than others. While many have, by habit and association, become entangled with other beliefs, not really instinctive, but falsely supposed to be part of what is believed instinctively. Philosophy should show us the hierarchy of our instinctive beliefs, beginning with those we hold most strongly, presenting each as much isolated and as free from irrelevant additions as possible. It should take care to show that, in the form in which they are finally set forth, our instinctive beliefs do not clash, but form a harmonious system. There can never be any reason for rejecting one instinctive belief, except that it clashes with others. Thus, if they are found to harmonize, the whole system becomes worthy of acceptance. It is, of course, possible that all or any of our beliefs may be mistaken, and therefore all ought to be held with at least some slight element of doubt. But we cannot have reason to reject a belief except on the ground of some other belief. Hence, by organizing our instinctive beliefs and their consequences, by considering which among them is most possible, if necessary, to modify or abandon, we can arrive on the basis of accepting as our sole data what we instinctively believe, an orderly systematic organization of our knowledge in which, though the possibility of error remains, its likelihood is diminished and the interrelation of the parts, and by the critical scrutiny which has preceded, acquiesce. This function, at least philosophy, can perform. Most philosophers, rightly or wrongly, believe that philosophy can do much more than this, that it can give us knowledge, not otherwise attainable, concerning the universe as a whole and concerning the nature of ultimate reality. Whether this is the case or not, the more modest function we have spoken of can certainly be performed by philosophy and certainly suffices for those who have once begun to doubt the adequacy of common sense to justify the arduous and difficult labors that philosophical problems involve.